Hello, good afternoon. So uh, today we're looking at uh, locks of identity and diversity and Williams of self in the future again. And what I want to do today is go a bit deeper into the arguments um, about memory and the self, memory and the identity of the self that we were looking at before. Um, so today, today is, is a little bit intricate um, and uh, you will have to follow me very closely as we go along these um, uh, elaborate paths. Um, on Thursday, we'll look at Derek Parfit's um, famous article, uh, Personal Identity, um, a kind of bombshell in the subject. And um, also on Thursday, uh, the essay is due soon, next Tuesday. Yeah, next Tuesday. Uh, and we have this thing, um, the first paragraph of your essay must state the main thesis for which you wish to argue in the essay. The last paragraph must restate the main thesis, summarize the way you have argued for it, and indicate any outstanding problems. So um, for the first essay, we, we, we did a brief thing where we asked people in the class, what's the thesis you're going to argue for? You see what I mean? Uh, you remember that? Uh, I thought that was kind of fun. I haven't tried doing that before. And if you like, if you don't mind, we might try that at the end for you know 10 minutes or something on Thursday. Yep. Is that OK? OK. 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 Um, so let's start out with um, an objection that uh, I think it was Austin mentioned last time to Locke's whole idea about memory and identity. Locke's idea seems to be you can define um, the identity of the self in terms of memory. You are whatever past person your memory reaches back to. Yeah, and we looked at ways you might make that a little bit more complicated. But that's the basic idea, that the later person is the same person as the earlier person if the later person remembers doing or seeing what the earlier person did. Yeah? That's, OK, that looks familiar. Um, and one classic objection to this was from Butler, who said, one should really think it evident that consciousness of personal identity presupposes and therefore cannot constitute personal identity. So that's very brief. That's kind of compressed. But what he's saying is, in order for memory to be reaching back to someone, it's got to be the same person as is doing the remembering. Memory presupposes identity. You can't define memory in terms of identity because identity is defined in, uh, because memory, sorry. <laughs> you can't define identity in terms of memory because memory is already defined in terms of identity. So the problem Butler's uh, suggesting here is really a basic one. I mean, let, give, let me give you a much simpler example of this kind of circularity. Um, you know the notion of gorse, G-U-R-S-E, gorse? I mean, it's a word I often, well, <laughs> maybe just the books I read, but I often came across the word gorse. It's, um, so it's some kind of plant. You know, the, the weary travelers make their way through a desert with nothing but gorse in it. And um, I thought, well, what is gorse anyway? Um, uh, for me, the word was familiar. But it, so I looked it up, and um, there's the definition, gorse. Uh, that's the way you pronounce it, all right. But that's what it means, furs. OK? I don't know if you can guess what my next question was. <laughs> <laughs> what is furs, right? Um, so um, then I looked up furs. And <laughs> what do we find? <laughs> now, you, you see that this is not helpful, right? We, we make very little progress with this kind of definition. And I mean, just to spell it out why this is circular, um, that if I now say, oh, gorse, OK, our old friend gorse. Now, what is gorse again? Then I, oops, then I go back here, and then I go back here. Now, you see what I mean? Yeah? So it's kind of circular. You, you, you just kind of loop round, yeah? Um, now, what you need there, well, I mean, well, what do you need if you want to find out what either of these words mean, furs or gorse? Some definition of the first word. Exactly. A third definition, right? You need a new definition, a third way. So you need something like being shown the thing. And you know, just <laughs> just in the interest of general um, 
edification, there it is. Gorse, <laughs> fog, right? Now you've got a third way of explaining what the thing is. And now you break out of the circle with that third way of explaining it. So the idea with uh, identity and memory is that these two terms can just be defined in terms of one another. If you try to define um, memory in terms of uh, uh, identity in terms of memory, you're just going to get a circle. And the way to uh, see the force of this is just suppose you ask, suppose you remember, say, um, last week's class. Suppose you remember what happened. Someone asked a particular question. You're saying, oh, yes. Or suppose it was a question you raised, right? And you're saying, yes, I remember raising that question. You say to me, I made that comment last week. I remember it. I made that comment. Right? So what has to have happened for you to have that memory, for you to remember making a comment last week? I say the first thing is you have to have the impression that you made that comment. Yes? That's all right? Follow me like a leopard. Follow me very closely here. Is that enough for you to remember making the comment? If you just have the impression that you made the comment. You have the impression that you made that comment, that you made the comment. Not just that the comment was made. Okay, so if you have the impression you made that comment, then does it follow that you remember making that comment? <laughs> it's, well, my suggestion would be it only seems to it may only seem to you that you remember. I say, no, my memory of the thing is clear as a bell. You were sound asleep for the entire class. You spoke not a word. You don't remember it. You may think you remember it, but you don't actually remember it. I mean, uh, sorry, <laughs> if anyone finds this unduly upsetting, the idea that they might have been asleep for the whole class. <laughs> I mean, you see what I mean? That's possible, right? So you could have the impression that you did it, but you didn't. And if you didn't do it, then you don't remember it. P had to actually occur, absolutely. Um, and it's not just that P actually occurred, um, uh, because suppose P occurred, but it's just an accident that you now have the impression that you remember it. Yeah? Suppose that I'm trying, I, suppose that I, well, let me switch your story because this is getting increasingly, um, what's the word, uh, uh, critical, negative. <laughs> suppose I am a kind of fantasist about the great comments I make in our little chat. Yeah? And I say, look, I said that to you last week. Yeah? Now, maybe it actually happened that I said it to you last week, but the old brain cells are not what they were. I have actually no genuine memories, but I just fantasized that I made that comment last week. And just as it happens, this is one of the few occasions in which I got it right. I told you you would have to follow me closely. Are you following me closely here? Yeah. It's a coincidence, right? So you need not just that you had the impression, but that you're having that impression was caused by the thing having happened. Yeah, it's not just a coincidence that you've got that impression and that the thing happened. You need that if it's going to be memory. Yep. Yep. Is that enough for memory? Suppose um, a someone made a brilliant comment, and I say, yes, I remember saying that last week. I remember saying that. And suppose that I have the impression of making that brilliant comment, and indeed, that brilliant comment was made. And that co the making of that brilliant comment is what's causing me to say that I remember it. Yeah? Is that enough for me really to remember it? Follow me like a leopard. Is that enough? No, because it might have been you that made that brilliant comment. And I just, um, how should I say, I just took it on board and said, yes, that was me. So it wasn't just a coincidence that I had the impression that that comment was made. Because it was the making of the comment that caused me to think that I made it. Because I just naturally appropriate anything good that happens in the class. You see what I mean? So I only remember it. I only remember making the comment if it was me that made it. I had to be the one that was there at the time. I had to be the one who actually made the comment. 
That's what it means. Memory presupposes identity. If I'm going to say I remember making that comment, well, for that to be true, it just had to be me that was the one that was there that did the thing. Yeah? Yep. Very good. Um, this is kind of an elastic phrase, the right kind of way, yeah. And you could say, yeah, the right kind of way involves it being the same person, yeah. I will shortly give an argument that says um, you might not need the full strength of that to specify the right kind of way, yeah. But you're right. I, in those terms, three is just a kind of elaboration of this comment, of the right kind of way comment. Yeah, you, you might well be right, yeah. Um, we'll, co we'll come on to that in a moment, yeah. Um, but even so, it doesn't really matter. Mem identity is still being presupposed by the definition of memory. Yes? That's right. I seem to remember doing it. No, 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 no. Hang on a minute. I seem to remember doesn't imply I do remember. But if someone seems to remember having been at the Battle of Waterloo, does it follow that they remember being at the Battle of Waterloo? That's what I seem to remember. I'm sorry, there's someone else. Is it? Yes, right. Do they genuinely think that they said it? Or yeah, let's suppose they genuinely think they said it. Yeah. Yeah. Would it be the difference between no recalling and even remembering it slightly? Even if the memory is slightly fuller, 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 is I'm thinking, I mean, Goethe began his, uh, in his autobiography, said something like, of the things I am about to, um, to recount, I do not know whether I remember them or whether they were merely things that were told to me. We usually make that distinction between what you actually remember and what you were told, say, about your childhood. And you really may not be sure which is which. Yeah? That, that just seems to be commonplace. I mean, Caused in the right kind of way by the past thing having happened. Yeah. Plain as day. You see why you need this condition? You had to be there at the time. If I say, do, if someone says to me, do you, did you shut the kitchen door? And I say, yes, I remember shutting the kitchen door. I remember it fine. But it wasn't me that shut it. It was you. And I don't, I don't remember shutting the kitchen door because I didn't do it. You did it. Yep. That's right. Someone else did it. That, well, in that case, I don't remember doing it. I think I remember doing it, but I don't. If I say I remember it perfectly well, that implies it's so. Yeah. And that it was me that did it. Yeah. If you say no, that <laughs> if you say, if you prove to me no, it was you that did it then you've taken away one of my memories. It might not be one of my most cherished memories, but <laughs> you <laughs> if it didn't happen at all, then again, it's not something I remember. It's just something I made up. Yeah, yeah. It should be more like that. More th it should be more the one that X is the one that did it or X is the one that saw it or whatever exactly it is you're remembering. Yeah, um, yeah so th that is kind of imprecise. Is this plain as day? Okay. In that case, you've got the circularity objection. It's the need for some condition like that three, you, X had to be there at the time. That means there's a problem for a memory theory of identity. Um, because what we're doing is, it's just like the Gorse and Forge case. 
you're um, trying to define identity in terms of memory, but memory is defined in terms of, uh, of identity. I mean, if someone says, as some uh, commenters were suggesting, um, oh, well, if someone s seems to remember the Battle of Waterloo, then they do remember the Battle of Waterloo. That's not what we say. We say, you weren't there. How can you remember the Battle of Waterloo? Okay. For you to remember the Battle of Waterloo, you had to be there. So if we think that identity and memory um, are just giving us a little circle here, you try to define identity in terms of memory, but memory is in terms of, ident terms of identity, then what do we need? A third thing, right? We need a third way of thinking about the identity of the self. Because if I'm going to say, well, you seem to remember being at the Battle of Waterloo, I accept you're perfectly sincere about that, but you, don't, you weren't there, then I must have some fix on whether or not you were there that doesn't involve going by way of your memory. Yes? I've got to have some other fix on whether it's the same person than by way of memory. And the natural thing to appeal to here is the identity of the body. Your body was not at the Battle of Waterloo. Your, the, you, the physical person here was not at the Battle of Waterloo. That's why we're going to say you can't remember. This is a little bit intricate, but are, are, is this, are, are, are we all on board? <laughs> Hello? Right, especially right at the back. Can you put your hand up if you're still on the bus? <laughs> I would describe that as encouraging, but not overwhelming. Um, does anyone want to, can you say, if, if you're not sure what's going on, can you say, can, can you try and pinpoint? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I can't see you. Um, uh -huh, Uh, well, th th there's no more to the identity of the person th than the identity of the body. I mean, you ca if you're going to define identity in terms of memory and then say that memory requires sameness of the person, yeah. then I've got to have my third way of getting on to what the sameness of the person requires. So now I say all sameness of the person requires is sameness of the body. So I define sameness of person in terms of sameness of the body, and that gives me my third way, my thing like, this, like seeing the ghost. Right. So you're saying that you would be in Japanese? I'm saying at this point we have to throw it out altogether because it just goes round and round. Oh, no, very good. Um, no, because I, I think memory requires sameness of the person. Yeah. Yeah, so if we're going to get the full force of it, we've got to define it in terms of something that's enough for sameness of the person. Jack, yeah. Uh, so, so I guess, so just remind me now, one option is the, the one we talked about first, which is the, the initial story of identity. Yes. The definition is kind of strange because at least in Japanese, it's just that. Very good. Yeah, are uh, you guys still there? We certainly are. Um, okay. <laughs> As usual, the class divides into the people who are way ahead of me and the people who have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> 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 Uh, yes. Very good. Yes, it would. It would. Uh, l l l let me let me come on to the prince and the cobbler. So keep keep pursuing this. Um, it, just a sec. Um, um, so the idea was Locke's idea was we're going to define X as the same person as Y. Um, and there's our old friend T1 and T2. Um, plus. <laughs> I think I must have some rare brain defect. <laughs> um, okay. Um, okay. So the idea was to define the later person as the same as the earlier person if the later person remembers doing what the earlier person did. But in order to know whether the later per in order for it to be true that the later person remembers doing what the earlier person did the later person has to be identical to the earlier person, right? So there must be some third fix you've got on wh which person you've got here, yeah? And that's what body gives you. The idea was, Locke's idea was, take memory between, two, between people at two times. That memory constitutes the identity. But the circularity criticism is, this memory 
already presupposes identity. So the identity you get out is only the identity you got you put in. An identity was presupposed here. So um, uh, we're not here explaining what identity comes to. We need some other sub explanation of what identity comes to. Please pause me at any moment here. Um, you, you're just okay. Uh, pl please pause me at any moment here. Um, if, if, if you see the point where it doesn't make sense, then let me know. Uh, okay, so um, the way Locke set it up is the person with the prince's body has all their memory transferred over to the cobbler's body. But the point here is that's a cheat, that way of setting it up, because the memory is just taking identity with it. Yeah? Um, so, of course, if it's described like that, um, you're going to say the cobbler, the later cobbler, the later cobbler body person is identical to the prince. But that's a cheat, right? You don't know how that, mani how that happens. Um, of course, if it's described like that and you're the prince and you're choosing, do you get tortured? Does this body get tortured and that body get rewarded? That's the choice you're going to make. Because if memory really went over, you'll be saying, yes, of course, my identity went over. Because memory presupposes identity. Memory just takes identity with it. Um, but if the memory is just something that carries the identity of the self with it, then the natural question is, well, how could that possibly be? Identity has got to be defined in some way outside of memory. The only way we know to do that is in terms of the identity of the body. And that makes it look like Williams's picture is much better. All that's going on here is you've got two people who've been driven mad. Um, they're the s in the same body throughout. The experimenter hasn't induced the change of bodies. He's produced one out of a range of equally possible situations that we'd be disposed to call a change of bodies. But really, you should just hang on to the idea that your fears can extend to future pain, whatever psychological changes precede it. Your fear about what's going to happen to you in terms of future pain can um, get over, a ch can cut through your going mad in the meantime. So until we're shown what's wrong with it, we should decide that if we were the person A, then if we were to decide selfishly, we should pass the pain onto the B body person. But that would be risky. There's a fact of the matter here, and we're not dead sure what it is. But you should assume that your identity goes with the body, not with the memory. Because the memory doesn't give you a fix on which person it is. Your memory presupposes another fix on which person it is. And the only fix we seem to have here is uh, identity of the body. So until we get clearer about this, we should just assume that identity goes with the body. So I'd just like to uh, check right now. If it, suppose that you are the prince. But how are you thinking about this right now? I asked you this a couple of times last time. But if you are the person with the prince's body and you're in this scenario, which body would you choose to be tortured? The prince's body or the um, uh, cobbler's body? Can you put your hand up if you choose the prince's body to be tortured? And if you choose the cobbler's body to be tortured? Whoa. There's not a whole lot in it, but I, I make it Williams by a, by a narrow head there. C can you do that again? The, um, the, you, you choose the prince's body to be tortured? Yeah. Um, are, you, are you saying that they had a memory transfer and that they were just not talking? The apparent memory transfer, yeah. I mean, the cobbler is talking as if he were the prince, yeah. Uh, as if you had been the cobbler. Yeah. I'm sorry, Toto. <laughs> okay. Okay, so on that understanding, um, if you choose the prince's body to be tortured, you being the prince. Okay, and if you choose the cobbler's body to be tortured, you being the prince. <laughs> this time it's kind of level pegging. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's very interesting. Okay, so Williams has made a lot of progress against Locke here. Okay, Okay. what I want to do 
in the rest of the time today is, um, so first of all, I want to suggest a way of getting this in, putting this um, question about the identity of the self, the identity of the person, into a more general context, a more general context for thinking about questions of identity. And um, then uh, come back to the, the idea that Jackson raised of talking about, uh, of, give, uh, of how a memory, a memory guy might respond to this. And if there's time, we'll get on to social recall. Um, Okay, object identity in general. I mean, what is the identity of an object? A table, you take a humble table or a lectern and you say, this is the same table that was here last week. What does it take for it to be the same table here now as it was here last week? I mean, people are very complicated objects, right? Thinking about their identity is very confusing. So suppose we took as an exercise thinking about the identity of something simpler. Suppose you took the identity of a dog what does it take for a dog that you see now to be the same dog as you saw there last week? How would you say what that is? Memory? Anyone? Yes? A continuation of experience. Very good. Um, you mean, yep. Yeah, it wouldn't have to um, have chains of memory, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, um, suppose you had an animal that wasn't conscious or that didn't seem to be conscious. I mean something like a shellfish. Shellfish? Are shellfish conscious? Yeah. <laughs> You're tough. <laughs> right. What about a bacterium? <laughs> what about an amoeba? <laughs> okay. What does the identity of an amoeba consist in? When is it the same amoeba that you're looking at now as you were looking at last week? Yep. Uh, yep. Similarities in structure. Similarities in the structure. You might have, couldn't you just have two different but very similar am amoebae? Yeah. They have the same aquatic period and they have the same aquatic period. Well, they're not similar. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> They're not that similar. <laughs> I mean, you'd have a lot of complaints. Um, you know, you uh huh. Yeah. Okay. I. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. How would you define it? Yes, let's suppose it's a week, yep. It would be continuous. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, that's, the, 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 that's how the, uh, in the classical stories people find out that Clark Kent is Superman, right? Because Clark Kent goes into the telephone box and then um, Superman comes out and there's only room for one person in the box, right? So they must be spatiotemporally continuous. Therefore, they must be one and the same. Yeah, that's how we argue. Or I mean... <laughs> That's how they argue in Metropolis or whatever it is. Yeah. Yep. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Right. Okay. So I think there's one really basic thing here that you could say is one and the same animal, not just a similar animal. If there's a continuous spatiotemporal path from uh, the later back to the earlier, if you tracked it moment by moment, never taking your eye off it, off it, at no point would there be a discontinuity, um, a, a kind of leap from being an animal here to an animal over here? Yeah, that's what it would take for it to be the same um, animal. Locke also has this notion of the same continued life, which is the cells are replacing one another, but the structure of the thing is saying the same, staying the same. Or um, uh, there was that idea of. Uh, the experiences are um, modulating one another from moment to moment over time. So I think what that really is, is it's a kind of causal condition. That's to say, the way the object is earlier is causing the object to be the way it is later. The way you are right now is causing you to be the way you are later. 
I mean, that's why people are always going on at you about health and diet and stuff like that. Because you think the way your body is now is going to affect the way it is later. Um, you can make differences to the way objects are now, uh, are later by making differences to the way they are now. And in general, for any concrete object, the later object is identical to the earlier object if the later object is causally connected to the earlier object. Let me give a simple demonstration of this. It's not similarity that matters for sameness of object, despite its earlier defense. It's not similarity. It's not even just spatiotemporal continuity. It's being causally connected from um, um, earlier to later. Causally connected means something like if there had been a difference in the way the thing was earlier, there would have been a difference in the way the thing was later. You know, I actually want to try a practical demonstration of this. This is a little bit abstract. So um, could I have a volunteer? Is, will someone, someone help me with this? Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. OK, so will, will, will you step up? Uh, OK, so consider it this simple table, right? I have here a simple table, ladies and gentlemen, a simple table. And I make a chalk mark on it, right? You see the chalk mark? I do. Right. Now, this, this is a table um, creator. Now, hold it gently and be careful where you point it. Um, wh <laughs> wh <laughs> when, you when you point it at a particular place and squeeze it gently, it makes a table. Okay, now, be careful. And don't point it at him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, it will make a table. Okay. And I have here a simple table annihilator. If I point this at a table and squeeze it gently, it scatters the atoms of the table to the corners of the universe. Okay, now, okay. Uh, are we all ready? Okay. Now, on the count of three, I want you to point it right there and squeeze gently. One, two, three. Whoa. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Um, and can you see an X mark there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think that <laughs> I think that that's w very well done. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now the question is: Is this the same table that was here before the experiment? <laughs> You're tough. <laughs> For the moment, accept the hypotheses I gave you. Yeah? It's just an accident that it turns out that this table looks just like the old one. Why is there an X on the table now? Because I put an X on the table earlier? No. It's just a coincidence. Right? When she pushed the, um, the creator, as you know, it just randomly produced a table. It could have been any kind of table. It just so happened by coincidence that this is an, has got an X on it just like the old one. Even if I hadn't put an X on the old table, there would still be an X here now. Yeah? You see what I mean? So there was a table here all the way through. Um, uh, because we, pe we pressed our annihilators and creators at the same time. The, old, the new table is very similar to the earlier table. But is it one and the same table on my hypotheses? No, clearly not, right? Because we just destroyed one table and made another one very similar. Put up your hand if that isn't absolutely plain as day. These are different tables, right? Put your hand up if you think, yes, clearly these are different tables. OK. OK. Um, so I say, what if you take a desk, right? It's not, uh, and say, what makes um, an, a later desk uh, the same as an earlier desk? It's not really just a continuous spatiotemporal path from the earlier desk to the later desk. Um, if you suppose a desk annihilator and a desk creator, and we point them both at the same desk at the same time, then marks on the desk after the zap aren't caused 
by how the diff was before the zap, right? So they're different diffs. Do you see what I mean? Suppose you go back to your old high school classroom and you're looking around the dear old place and you say, my God, there is a desk just like the one I used to sit at. And you look at it closely and my God, there they are, your initials carved on the desk. And you say it's the same one. You're assuming that those marks in the desks there now are there because of um, uh, uh, the, your activity earlier. Yeah? The way the desk is now is caused by the way the desk is earlier. See, that's why you take it they're the same desk. If you thought you'd been through that annihilator and crater uh, scenario, then you say, no, this is just a very similar desk to my old one. Now, the thing about that is that's absolutely general. When you think about memory, memory is when the world reaches in and carves its initials on your brain. The way you are now is because of the way you were earlier. With animals in general, and what you want for it to be the same animal you got now as you had earlier is that the biological condition of the animal now should be caused by the way it was earlier. Now, people, as someone said already, people are very complicated objects. They're much more complicated than amoebae or um, 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 tables <laughs> or desks or whatever, What's, um, or rabbits or... Uh, um, yeah, so when you're asking, is this the same person now as you had earlier? What you're asking there really is a question about what kind of causal connections are there between the way the thing is now and the way that thing was earlier. And because people are so complicated, there are lots of different ways you can ask the question. You can ask it as a question about are the psychological properties later caused by the psychological properties earlier? Or is, it, or is what really matters to us that the physical properties later should have been caused by the physical properties earlier? So one kind of theory would be the later person is the same as the earlier person if the uh, later physical properties are causally dependent in the right kind of way on the earlier physical properties. And if you think that, uh, that that's the key thing for identity of the person, you'll say that's the prince all the way through here on the left. On the other hand, you can take this idea about causation and put it in a kind of psychological key. You can say the later person is the same as the earlier person if the psychological properties of the later person are causally dependent in the right kind of way on the psychological properties of the earlier person. Okay? Um, and if you think like that, uh, let me just complete my, my thought. <laughs> the, 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 um, if you think like that, you'll say, look, the psychological properties of this later cobbler body person, the psychological properties going on over here are causally dependent on the psychological properties going on over here. The psychological properties of the later prince body person don't depend on the psychological properties of the earlier prince body person. The physical properties do causally depend. What's going on in this kind of case is a dissociation between what's happening at the level of psychological properties and at the level of physical properties. You're getting a causal connection up, up in this dimension at the level of physical properties, but the causal connection in this dimension at the level of psychological properties. Um, so uh, that's, um, uh, the, th that's what's at issue when you're arguing about um, for how does it go in the Prince and the Cobbler case, that's, how it's, that, that's what's at, at issue between Locke and Williams when Locke says uh, that the Cobbler body person is the same as the earlier Prince body person and Williams disagrees. Really, they're just, um, they're just putting different weight on psychological properties or physical properties. They're saying, one, one of them is saying the causal connections among the psychological properties are what matter for the identity of the person. The causal connections among the physical properties are what matter for the identity of the person. You, it's harder to get that kind of case for a simple table because it's very much harder to think of a case where you'd get that kind of fractioning, that, that kind of differentiation between two kinds of properties that the table has. But with people, it seems fairly easy. 
to do it. Don't need to think of it. Um, so William said, well, when you're talking about the memories crossing from one body to another, you're supposing that some kind of self is crossing from one body to another. There's some kind of ghosts passing between them. And that's clearly just a fantasy. But that's pushing it a bit, it seems to me. That's not the right way to put it. The right way to put it is we're not quite sure which kinds of properties to emphasize as really mattering for the identity of a person. OK, I'm sorry, there were some questions that I just saw. Uh, Rush Davis. I'm saying that we've got a general notion of concrete objects. Yeah? That's to say, there are, there are objects in mathematical heaven, like the numbers. Yeah? There are abstractions, like love of country, um, um, revenge. Right? There are abstractions like that. And then there are concrete objects, like a simple piece of chalk, or a desk, or a person. Yeah? That's a, that's a reasonably clear distinction. There are concrete objects that are, that are located in time and space. Um, uh, just the kind of basic humdrum regular things like you or me or um, 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 chairs and so on. Yep. And I say there's a general notion of identity for any concrete object. And that has to do with causal connections between the way the thing er is earlier and the way the thing is later. If the way the thing is earlier is causing the way the thing is later, then that's the same object. And I say that's fully general. That applies to any concrete object at all. And you can think of these puzzles about persons as coming up just because persons are kind of complex objects. So there's a lot of structure in that kind of causal connection. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, could you speak a little louder? What causes the change of the properties? Yeah. One of the components. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not quite getting it. Th th suppose you have the liver transplantation. Yeah. Then th there's c th there's going to be a kind of um, um, qu matter of quantity here as to how much of what's going on later causally depends on what's happened earlier, yeah? So if I've been punishing my liver all these years, yeah, then what I was doing earlier is causally affecting how it is with a bit of me now. You, you see what I mean? Yeah, but then when you transplant the liver, some of that causal connection is eliminated. I can start afresh liver-wise. No, 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 just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course there are cases, but generally the liver is not the person. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, the, the, the liver is just a component, to, yeah? The liver is just a part. W what I mean is, though, that um, I agree, I, I would agree that the li liver-wise, you're causally getting a, f a new fresh start, right? The condition of this liver does not depend on what you were doing earlier. Yeah. That, that, so that's to say, that that's, that's part of what it means that it's a different liver. If it's the same old liver. Oh, that's you getting a new start. That's you get a whole new start. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> whole, that's what we say, a whole new you, right? Um, <laughs> um, but if none of it was causally dependent on what you were doing earlier, the thing in the liver case is the vast majority of what's going on with you later is still causally dependent on what you were doing earlier. The liver's only a bit of the, a, a bit of the whole picture. Yeah. So it's really a kind of, um, it's a matter of quantity here, how much of the later condition is causally dependent on how much of the earlier condition. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's important. Uh, 
that's very good. Is this an argument for everything being determined? Um, it's not meant to be uh, for free will. I mean, it connects to some of what we said uh, came up earlier about free will. If you think of free will as a matter of, you just get a whim coming from out of the blue, and it doesn't depend on anything that you earlier thought or did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you have that picture, then I agree there's something threatening here um, in the idea that the later stages must have been caused by the earlier stages. Yeah. Um, but um, th there are two parts to this. One is, I think that ordinarily what we want by free will is not that you should be having kind of existential whims out of nowhere. You know, what you want is that you should be being true to your authentic self and your actions. Y you see what I mean? It goes to the core of me. Back since I was a child, since I was a child I've had these strong beliefs in whatever it is. Y yeah. um, um, healthy exercise. <laughs> You know, whatever it might be. And so the exercise of freedom here is in my um, uh, being true to my earlier self. Yeah, that's usually what you think of, not just a matter of existential whims that just come out of nowhere. I mean, who, who wants to live like that? You, you, you see what I mean? That's, that, that, that seems more like um, uh, kind of acts of randomness uh, than what you call freedom. Yeah. So freedom, you could think, uh, it seems to actually de demand a causation of the late, later self by the earlier self. Um, I, I, I know what you mean, though. There is that picture, oh, I'm just in the grip of my earlier self. And that can happen, too, where you see, well, people are just creatures of habit. They're not really free. But I think what, what you need to look at there are the details of the kind of causation that we're thinking about, yeah, rather than looking for no causation at all. But that's an important question. I, 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 I don't want to suggest that's the end of the story. Yeah. Plain as day? So you see that's an abstract frame for thinking about identity, that you can just drop in all these questions you've been thinking about. OK. OK, let's look again this thing about circularity. Circularity, quasi-memory. Remember the definition of memory? What is it for a person to remember a particular past event? You're being told, you, you, someone's saying to you um, uh, that they remember uh, making a comment. So they have to have the impression that the thing occurred and um, they're having that impression has to be caused in the right kind of way by the thing having occurred, and they had to be there at the time. They had to be. Ha they had to have been the one who was making the comment or doing the thing. Um, and it's the need for this third condition that makes there be circularity. So, if we want to defend Locke, if we want to have a memory criterion, we've got to do something about this. We've got this definition of memory. And we've got this third condition in it that brings an identity. So if we want to define identity in terms of memory, but we think, well, this gives us circularity, this gives us that ghost cause thing, what do we do? How could we proceed? If we don't like defining memory identity in terms of this th complex three-part notion, because the third part is giving us trouble. Hello, in class. Sorry? Causal connection to the past. Yeah, we want to get that effect of a memory type causal connection to the past, right? Memory is a causal connection to the past. That's, that's caught by the second condition there. Yep. Memory is when the world reaches in and carves its initials on your brain. Um, but um, if that's the important bit, and this third bit is giving us trouble, then what should we do with the third bit? Throw it out, yes. <laughs> Throw the rascal out, okay? Let's toss it out. Now that resulting definition 
is not going to be a definition of memory because the ordinary notion of memory um, requires that sort of condition. But suppose we just toss it out. Suppose we say, um, I'm going to talk about quasi-memory. Follow me very closely. Quasi-memory. Quasi-memory is when you have the impression that the past thing occurred um, and you're having that impression is caused in the right kind of way by the past thing having occurred. I mean, you, the, 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 this is pretty intuitive, I think. Suppose, um, you know how it is when people travel and they, 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 they say, um, well, I saw the Taj Mahal. And uh, they say, well, um, here are some slides of the Taj Mahal. And they, they say the thing that people always say. But of course, looking at the slide doesn't tell you how big it is. Um, you don't really get any sense of the size from that. I mean, it's really, really big. Um, then think how much better it would be if you were trying to show people what kind of time you'd had at the Taj Mahal if, I mean, let's suppose that in the future, people have their brains machined so that uh, they have memory slides that when you go on vacation, your memories are just laid down in slides. And maybe early in childhood, people have kind of slots machined in their head so that when you come back, you don't need to um, uh, show them pictures. You can just drop a memory slide in their head. And then they have your memory of the past thing. right? So they can drop in your head a slide of the Taj Mahal. And you say, wow, that's big. right? So suppose that someone drops a memory slide of the Taj Mahal in your head. right? So there's that evening with people walking to and fro. Um, that uh, beautiful, peaceful scene. Now, do you have the impression, now that you've got the memory slide, that that scene occurred? Do you have the impression? <laughs> Class, <laughs> right? You do have the impression that the scene occurred. Is that impression, is you having that impression caused in the right kind of way by the scene occurring? Yes, I mean, the scene just reached in and um, impressed the brain that made that slide in just the usual kind of way, yeah? So that's just the right kind of causal connection for memory. You got the slide in your head. Do you remember, do you now remember that scene? Could you now say, I remember seeing the Taj Mahal. Your friend drops the slide in your head and you say, Yes, I remember that summer evening. Of course you can't. You weren't there. Right? You never left Berkeley the whole time. You don't remember it at all. Yeah? Um, I feel like you're saying that it's a thing that could be later in history, like watching a film about it. And That's right. Ex it would be like watching a film about it. And if you said, oh, yes, I remember old India so well, um, people would naturally say, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> you think you do, but you don't. You see what I mean? Th th that is what people would say. Um, if you, having got the memory slide, say, I remember that evening oh so well, the obvious answer is, oh, you don't, because you weren't there. So this is not memory. Is that quasi-memory? Yes, quasi-memory is when you meet the first two conditions, but not the third. Right? So this is a notion of qua this notion of quasi memory has got all the good bits of memory in it, if you see what I mean, but not the identity. Yep, yes. Uh that too is true, yes. Um we're we're postponing that for the for the moment. Yeah, it may come back to that on Tuesday actually. Uh it should have been Tuesday, yeah, yeah. Um but the thing is, if the brain slide was laid down you know, if that bit of brain was configured in the same way that the brain usually gets configured just by observing a scene, yeah, then it's very, very similar the position here to what usually happens. Yeah. Um, a room that shows the Taj Mahal. Yes. But we have the same impressions. Yes, right. 
And even if that's, and that might be a recreation of a past scene because of the way, w the way it was back then. Are you trying to get a causal connection in here? Oh, you don't like the brain slides? Yeah. No, no, you, you have to have the brain slides. The brain slides are key. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> the brain slides are not optional. <laughs> I mean, rooms that look just like the Taj Mahal, for some other purpose, they, they're fine. Yeah, I, I, I don't have any, you, you do that. <laughs> well, it's just like memory, except you missed out the identity. That's the point. The identity was a key thing. The whole package, the whole sensory package. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll come back to it. Yeah. yeah. He, he understands the situation exactly. He knows his friend just popped the slide in. Yeah. And he says, wow, um, I'm so jealous or whatever, right? But if his friend leaves him the memory slide, then he will always have that quasi memory to treasure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He now gets it from the inside, is the thing. If you see what I mean? It's from the inside for him, just as it is for his friend when his friend was remembering. Uh, yeah. The what thing? Oh, yes, the ghetto thing. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. That's very good. That that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Th th that's a great kind of case. It really connects to that thing about the right kind of way, because suppose suppose that you and I saw the Taj Mahal together. Yeah, and um, uh, I have a picture of the scene, and you're saying, I just don't remember any of that stuff. Is that really true? I don't remember that, I don't remember that at all. And um, I show you the picture, and you build it up. You, you, you believe me, you build up your sense of how it was back then, yeah? And uh, you say, okay, okay, um, but I still don't remember it, yeah? Then you've got a memory impression that's caused in a way that's very like regular memory. I mean, it's accurate, it's reliable. Um, you build up this impression of what it was like back then, but you still say, I don't remember it, yeah? And the thing is, as you rack your brain, there might come the moment when you say, aha, now I remember, yeah? And intuitively, the thing is, if you think of your head, I'm sorry, it's not a very good likeness, but <laughs> if you suppose that's your head, then there's, a, there's that past scene at the Taj Mahal and a causal connect going from um, the way from the past scene through the picture to your current impression, yeah. But the reason you don't you say it's not memory is that you want one wants intuitively, I mean, commonsensically, one wants an internal connection, something in the brain. But for it to be memory, it's not enough that the past scene be causing in a reliable way your current impression is that the past scene at the time had to lay down a trace in your brain. And what happens when you say, aha, now it all comes back to me, um, is that that trace gets activated. I think that's the common sense picture of memory. Th th that's what you meant. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's the common sense picture of memory, and that's something you do with the right kind of way. And that's why it's important that it's memory slides, yeah, because you're getting that internal thing of the memory trace being activated. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you, right, so you and your childhood friend both remember creating a poem. Each of you remembers that you were the one that did it. Yeah. Yes, very good. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah, because you've got, well, let's see, let me just think about that a minute. Um, you say you meet your old friend and you say, "Remember that great, great rhyme I I, I, I created," and uh, your friend says, "Wait a minute, <laughs> that was me. I treasure that memory." Yeah, yeah. Th that's the kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great case actually. Um, that uh, uh, 
on the first pass, it can't be, um, you can't both be right. Because only one of you can really remember, can really be the one who did it. So that third condition wouldn't be met. But then if you ask, is it caused in the right kind of way for both of you? Is it even a quasi-memory for, bo for both of you? Then I think probably not, because it would be just for that kind of reason that only one of you has had the memory by laying down a trace in the right kind of way. The other one, um, it went to some more indirect way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But that's a, that, uh, that needs more discussion. I might come back to that in two years. But, uh, that's a great question. Okay, so now we've got a notion of quasi-memory that doesn't involve identity. That's okay. So can we now define the later person is the same as the earlier person if the later person quasi-remembers what the earlier person saw and did? Let me first ask you, is this definition circular? No, that was the point of all, that was the whole point, right? This one is not circular, right? We dropped out the identity bit. So that was what Jackson was saying earlier. Couldn't you stick with a memory criterion, but just drop out the, the identity bit? So this is going to give you um, um, uh, a definition of, me of identity in terms of memory that is not circular. But um, does it work? No? That's a, bit <laughs> that's a bit of a blow. <laughs> All that heroic effort, and now it doesn't work. How, how come it doesn't work? Who, who said that? Yeah. Uh, is it? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Is it so just one slide, I'm going to quiz. I remember what, you, what, what happened. But that doesn't mean I was the one that was there. Yeah, was that your objection too? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree that's pretty devastating, actually. But consider another scenario. Um, suppose that um, I come back from my trip to the Taj Mahal. Uh, let me just. Um, suppose we have these brain slides, right? Suppose we've got that scenario. Suppose I come back from my trip to the Taj Mahal and I say to you, hey, look, come and see my slides. And so I drop in a couple of slides. And that's no more boring than it usually is when people show you slides, right? You say, okay, your slide, you, you say, fantastic, yeah. Um, and so then, you, I'm not identical to you at that point, right? I've got the quasi memory, yeah? But suppose that what happens is I just keep going. I give you some, and then I'm just sharing quasi memories with you. But now, um, I keep going. I give you the slides of my trip to the Taj Mahal. I give you the slides of my trip to the pyramids. Um, I provide you with slides from my early childhood. Uh, I'm, I keep going. I s eventually, I'm having to scoop out bits of your brain to make way for the new slides coming in. After a bit, this is not just very, very boring. This is <laughs> authentically scary, right? Because if I just keep going, then what's happening is not that um, I am sharing too many memories. I am taking over your body. You are ceasing to exist. If I flood out your memories with my quasi-memories, well, in the end, I annihilate you. I take over your body. So if that's right, the right way to think about it is you can define um, identity in terms of quasi-memory by saying the later person is identical to the earlier person if the overwhelming majority of the later person's memory impressions, the overwhelming majority of these qu later quasi-memories have been caused in the right kind of way by what the earlier person saw and did. So I've now got a definition. I mean, the key thing is the overwhelming majority bit. And if you think about that scenario where I just flood out your brain, then by the end of the process, it might be clear that I've taken over your body 
And at the start of the process, as people said, it might be clear that I haven't taken over your body. I've just shared a couple of slides. But then there's going to be some intermediate cases where if you stop the process there, you're not quite sure to what, what to say has happened here. It's really a terrible situation. Um, but um, if you have that notion, I mean, I think there's some indefiniteness in the way we'd ordinarily think about the identity of the self there. But if you... Um, um, are at the end point where it's clearly the overwhelming majority of the later impression thing. Okay, here we have a definition of identity in terms of quasi memory. Yeah? So I said, this <laughs> just a sec, I said the circularity objection that we started out with, that seems to show you need a third way. Yeah, you've got to appeal to the body or something like that. But this strategy shows you don't need the third way. Um, you could do it without appealing to the body at all. Um, you could just define the notion of quasi-memory and define identity in terms of that uh, one that you're thinking about. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very good. I, I, I could hang on to that frame. I could think, this is terrible what's happened to me. I'd be living with all your memories. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree that's, that seems possible. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th th these are both fair enough. Um, the, I mean, the trouble with the kind of sense you're talking about of um, this isn't really me is, <laughs> I, sh I don't want to give away too much about myself here, but it seems to me you can have this thing of feeling distanced from your own life and saying this isn't really me. Yeah, you can have that sense of alienation in your own life. Um, this is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful wife. <laughs> what, what's going on? Yeah, you can have that anyway. Um, that doesn't mean that your framing thought here, the alienation thought, is the correct one, and the actual overwhelming number of memories you've got are the wrong ones. There's a kind of balance of power uh, uh, thing here as to which is wh which is getting to constitute the identity of the self. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, when what happens? Yes, right, right. I'm saying it could happen. I mean, I agree with the previous question that it could certainly happen. You continue to have that feeling of alienation. My, my only comment in that was we don't always regard that feeling of alienation as authoritative. We sometimes say, well, you've just, <laughs> you've just got to live in the real world and get on with things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not clear what when that's going to be the right reaction and when not. But if the, um, if the memory theory is right, then uh, uh, it's going to be the quasi-memories that are the key things. So you could accept Locke's thing about the prince and the cobbler and say um, body swaps are possible People can swap bodies in its perfect sense. Th that doesn't mean that um, uh, uh, we're dualists. We don't have to say that um, people are just human beings either. People might not be human beings. Um, so I think it's a live option to say we, we, are, we, we think that the notion of a concrete object in general is a causal notion about the way that the earlier characteristics affect the later characteristics. Um, but I uh, think that in the case of people, it's the psychology always that really matters. That's certainly a possible view, I think. Yeah? Okay, I want to make just one, uh, if you can bear it, I want to have just one last comment. So 
Total Recall is a movie I've had. I've never actually seen it, but I've <laughs> it's one of these things. I've had its plot explained to me so often by students, but I feel like I have seen it, which <laughs> I guess doesn't mean that I remember having seen it, but I certainly have very vis vivid visual imagery of what goes on in it. What? Yeah, well, I don't know. Um, I certainly have vivid, vivid impressions of it. Um, so the story is something like this. Um, Douglas Quayle, a do, do you guys know this movie? Yeah, yeah. Some, of you, some people do, yeah. Um, it was a classic Schwarzenegger movie and then there was a remake. Uh, Douglas Quayle, a simple and ordinary man, w wishes to visit Mars, as, as one does, right? Um, he, has, he has a very tedious grinding job and he wants to visit Mars, but he can't afford to visit Mars. So he visits a company, Recall Incorporated, that instead of taking you to Mars, it offers you something much cheaper, implanted memories um, of a trip to Mars. Um, so they try to implant some um, racy Mars memories into Quail of his life there as a secret agent. But in the course of doing that, they get a very violent reaction from Quail um, that reveals that he actually is a dangerous under um, um, undercover government assassin. His mind is full of dangerous secrets. They've just been masked in order to let him carry out his regular job and keep his cover. So they get Quail out of their office and now he's um, keen to find out who the real me is, right? This is, a <laughs> this is not mere abstract speculation we're doing here. This is a real guy, right? Um, with real concerns about the identity of the self. He wants to find out what the real self is. He's no longer going to take his regular memories at face value because they've been implanted to over to as an overlay on his real identity. The government initial so these memories he these regular memories he has of his regular job and so on of his regular life, these are actually quasi memories. Yeah, these are things that really happen, but they don't relate to him. His real life is a life as an underground government, undercover government assassin. The government initially seeks his death. <laughs> that's, that's very good. But instead, Quail manages to make a deal. He returns to recall to have his Mars memories once more suppressed and is offered by way of compensation a set of heroic wish fulfillment uh, false memories. The recall staff begin the memory implanting procedure and uncover a different and older set of suppressed memories, revealing that the unbelievable memories they are about to insert are already there. I don't know why it says and are there, but anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, so what you've got here, and this may, I mean, people are very comfortable working with this kind of idea, is a set of layers of quasi-memories. Yeah. And you take it that um, uh, you can make perfect sense. You talk about a mem person's memory having been subsumed under a layer of implant or under several layers of implant. And there's some notion of the true person there that seems, I mean, if, if you thought something like this had happened to you, it would seem terribly important to you to sort out what was going on, which one was the real you. Very few people would say, um, well, I don't, you know, how do I care which one is the real me? Um, I'm just going to get on with things. It would seem like the most important thing in your life to find out which one was the real you. And the picture I think we have is that the real person is the person whose memories r are at the bottom level here, whatever exactly that means, the lowest level of quasi-memory. So what that brings out is actually the importance of memory for identity. Um, the mere sameness of body, that's not what matters for sameness of person at all. I think the Williams thing is very powerful. But he, he must be wrong. Um, what we think matters for sameness of person, what in practice anyone would really take it is the important thing for sameness of person, is not the human being at all. It's the, l it's the memories and the connections between the psychological properties at one time and the psychological properties at a later time. Any other comments? Okay, then on Thursday, we'll move on to perfect and the survival of the self. Okay, thanks, guys.